Welcome back, sir. Hi, right? Anna, you can tell us when yes, to start. Sir. Yes, sir. Doro, how is Abaji? It's fine. Fine? It's a, ah. yeah, yeah. Absolutely fine. Working away. Yeah. Now everyone is working, yeah. Everybody is working. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody is back to work. Yeah. Doing at least three to four OPDs a week, uh, but but it's uh, it's hard for the clinicians, you know, to wear PPE and, yeah. and all that, and do and you have to now uh, space it out a lot. Yeah. <clears throat> you know? So it, it's just longer hours. Ah uh, yes, that's true. Yeah. So I think it takes longer time. It takes longer time, yeah, and longer hours, and slowly people have to start. Right. It's a test of patience. Doctor Gabba, how is how are things with you? Doctor Gabba, can you listen? Oh, everything is okay. I was just distracted. Okay, okay. I was just thinking. I was just asking. How is how is the situation there with you? As far as COVID is concerned. What kind of situation you mean? <laughs> uh, wait, sir, I just need two minutes. We are, we'll be live in so, two minutes. Uh, uh, I okay. am now between China and uh, Australia. You see, right now I am talking from the uh, laboratory of Itavitro. In China, there is no COVID anymore. Okay. Zero, nothing. Okay, okay. And in Australia, where I am really now, in Queensland, uh, there is no COVID as well. So we, since 30, 40 days, see, we did not have any community transmission, just okay. imported people, and they were uh, select, uh, separated, so there was no infection at all. <laughs> but in the rest of the country, in Victoria, in New South Wales, the situation is quite demanding. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, at least here we are okay, and it is a big country, Queensland. Yeah. yeah. Like half India. Yeah. So are there still restrictions as, as far as the public uh, transport or? Malls or theaters are concerned? Uh, in fact, Queensland is totally separated from the rest of the country. Nobody can come here, nobody can go away from Queensland. Mm -hmm. But here, you can do anything, practically mm -hmm. anything. There are some very small restrictions <laughs> in the number of people in the restaurants and so on and so on, but that's all. Okay. And we never had the feeling, we are countryside, almost every Queensland and that lives in a family house, we never had took it very seriously. If you were restricted to home, you had the big garden, the swimming pool, everything, you enjoy life. Okay. I think Dr. Nitin Lara has joined. So yeah. yeah. I'll just check. I'm just searching for his name. Uh, and uh, we are, we'll be live on Facebook in just two seconds. <laughs> We 
have more than uh, 70 people who have already joined. Yeah. Yeah. Waiting to, here we can see 102. Yeah, 102. People are ah. still joining. Yeah, yeah. Um, I yeah. have so some I issues think, uh, in launching for the live streaming. I'll do it meanwhile. So mm. we can just start off with the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You started. Yeah, yeah. 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 start. In? Hi. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Hi. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Hi. Hi, hi. 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 Hi, Goral, how are you? I'm good. Welcome. Great. Wait, sir, we are good to go? Yeah, 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 good to go. Okay, fine. So, so good evening. Vijay, how are you? I'm fine. Thanks. Uh, good evening to everybody. So, welcoming you all to the third edition of uh, Simplifying Embryology. Today's topic is the vitrification technique. So I, on behalf of IHERA and Zydus, welcomes all delegates. So today's uh, highlight, today's coordinator is Dr. Ved Prakash and Dr. Uh, Pranay Ghosh. The academic partners is uh, Zydus, makers of Ryavine Nitrogen, Zaya Chemji. So I'll just give some brief about uh, Dr. Ved and Dr. Pranay, although they don't need any introduction. But nevertheless, I'll just give some brief about them. Dr. Ved Prakash, uh, is uh, the lab director, Southern Fertility and IVF uh, Center, Delhi and NCR. He's master in biotechnology, trained in IVF and ICSI from Andrology and IVF lab, KK Women's and Children's Hospital, Singapore. He has advanced IVF, ICSI and embryo biopsy training at AZBU, Brussels. He's the vice president academy of clinical embryologists, India. Um, Thank you. Uh, welcome, sir. Um, Next coordinator for the day today, we have Dr. Pranay Ghosh. He is the director at Elixir Fertility Center. He is the consultant of the Double Helix uh, Clinical Cytogenics and Reproductive Immunology Center. He is MBBS, uh, MAMC, MS from MAMC. He is uh, MM uh, Med uh, Psych ART from University of Kiel, Germany. Specialist training in reproductive medicine, NUS, uh, Singapore. Uh, he has done his fellowship in minimal access surgery. Estra certified clinical embryologist. His special interests include uh, reproductive immunology, oocyte and embryo biology, and optimizing strategies for ESET. So, welcoming you, Dr. Veer and Dr. Pranay. Um, over to you. Uh, we are looking forward to a very interesting session today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sahana, for my introduction. So on behalf of IHERA and our academic partner Jairus Cadilla, I welcome you all. As you know, IHERA is continuously working to provide you knowledge through our free webinars. And this time our topic is vitrification technique. Today we have very uh, good international faculty, Dr. Gabor Vasta and Dr. Esther and with Dr. Uh, Vijay Mangoli and uh, Dr. Goral, Goral Gandhi. They are going to moderate our panel. And as you know, that vitrification uh, made our life easy. Earlier, with slow freezing, we have to spend two, three hours for uh, freezing the embryo or site. And uh, uh, now, uh, the vitrification made our life very easy, that in the sense key we are doing it in very less time and getting very good results also with the survival rate uh, it is increased survival rate also uh, now it uh, time to introduce dr gabor vasta over to dr pranay ghosh pranay please introduce dr gabor thank you so much sir. so it's a proud privilege to introduce dr gabor vasta uh, what can I say about him? He has been a uh, pioneer in the field of embryology. Uh, he started as a uh, pathologist, uh, but uh, made a shift over to embryology a long time ago. And he is almost synonymous with something as some of the terminologies like uh, well of well system, then open full straw, some of his patented work. Dr. Vasta has been a past professor at the Copenhagen University in Denmark. James Cook University at Australia, Central Queensland University in Australia, and BGS in 
and uh, he has recently uh, started his own uh, venture and is a freelancer consultant embryologist and the founder of uh, Vita in, uh, Vita Vitro Shenzhen China. Uh, we also know Dr. Vesta as uh, having a keen interest in gardening, trekking, biking, as is evident from his fisherman's hat and his uh, uh, his love for photography and uh, the pictures that we see of him. Uh, he has a plethora of uh, publications. He has over uh, 300 publications uh, and over 150 peer-reviewed uh, articles. And his uh, citations I have crossed over 10K, uh, which is a humongous uh, amount. So uh, without further ado, without taking much of the time, I'd like to uh, have Dr. Vesta on the screen, please. Welcome, sir, and over to you. OK. May I start the presentation? Yes. Arne, you have to stop the presentation. It says? Stop sharing. I'd start again, OK. It says that you cannot, OK. Mm -hmm. It should be OK now. May I ask you to close all the small screens for other people because I, I probably don't have enough space for the slides. So if it is on the right side, some part of my slides will disappear. Okay, so let's start. First, thank you very much for the invitation. In fact, my job seems to be easy regarding the science vitification and especially troubleshooting vitification, because in fact, vitification is one of the most reliable procedures in embryology. We have simple solutions, a basic medium and three simple components simple and well-defined steps in predetermined and relatively short time frame. And uh, simple, may I say, primitive manipulations. So primitive that even I can do it. So what can go wrong? Of course, if anything can go wrong, it will go wrong. It was just an illustration. So, we have potential problems with selection of the method, lab environment, chemicals, temperature, liquid nitrogen, bench arrangement, time frame, handling, cooling, storage, warming, dehydration, culture, everything. A lot of things to worry about. And you have to consider it is human life. So let's start with the selection of the method. According to some estimations, more than 100 different methods for vitification are available worldwide. And this is excluding the countless personal modifications. In some way, fortunately, the vast majority of these methods and modifications are useless. Does not result in any improvement most of them even compromise the overall efficiency. On the other hand, the scope of those used by the really successful groups is surprisingly narrow. May I say up to four to five. You could tell that I am too strict, but I talk about embryo and oocyte vitification. Embryos can be vitified easier but oocyte is a demanding task. So on my list, the candidates for the best and most widely used methods are the cryotope of Vitazato and its two clones, the cryotech and the cryolock version of Irvine uh, vitification methods. So what is common in these methods? The principles ethylene glycol and DMSO as permeable cryoprotectant and equal amount at each concentration. One or multi-step long equilibration with permeable cryoprotectants 
than ones that short dehydration in permeable and non-permeable cryoprotectants. And then, if applicable, aseptic storage in sealed containers through then warming with direct contact to non-permeable cryoprotectant, first step at 37 degree, and uh, two or three step rehydration with non-permeable cryoprotectant. In fact, all these principles were published in 1998 with the OPS method, including the sterile application. So I think we have all reason to insert the open pulse through, which is now reincarnated by Vita Vitro to the list. Regarding the laboratory environment, first of all, I have to emphasize that vitrification is not a social event. So I don't like to have happy, energetic, and uh, disregarding students in the lab. I don't like to have visitors. I don't like to have representatives of companies in the lab when we make vitrification. A quiet and clean place is needed, which is used only for vitrification. Preferably no laminar box, but I will talk about this later. Definitely no destruction. No phones, except for some very special purposes. And if possible, no bosses. Well, bosses may come in, ask stupid questions, may give instructions, disturb the work. You have to say, if you can allow that, oh, pardon. I work now with specification and I have only one chance. And it is true. And for chemicals, you are in a privileged situation now. You don't have to do, you don't have to make homemade solutions. But I just want to tell you that the only critical component of this solution is DMSO. DMSO has got a bad reputation because it was supposed to be toxic. In fact, the clean original DMSO is one of the most harmless solvents in bio biology and the bad reputation is the result of bad handling because it is sensitive to light and oxygen so i suggest you to buy if you need it small ampoules 5 to 10 ml ampoules and use them entirely when you make the solutions definitely not bottles and most definitely not transparent light bottles. And one more additional suggestion, probably it will be good for you. If you have a tested good medium and it is not just vitrification, it is everything, every medium we use in the laboratory. Keep some part of this medium and store for control at minus 80 Celsius, ultra deep freezer. which can be purchased with a relatively modest price and which is practically the most important equipment or among them in an embryo laboratory. You can do with every solution indefinitely. I don't suggest you for legal and for commercial reasons, I don't suggest you to use this media indefinitely for human embryos, but for controls to compare with a medium which is of questionable value to troubleshoot, it is an excellent possibility. And then the temperature. We used to say that the initial phase of vitrification and also the last steps of the rehydration should be done at room temperature or ambient temperature. What what we mean? In north of Germany, room temperature is 18 Celsius. In Spain, it is probably 22, 23 Celsius. In tropical areas, especially if you don't have air condition working, it is 30 Celsius. No, nothing. 25 Celsius. These methods, I was there, were established 
parameters were adjusted to a temperature of 25 Celsius. So what I suggest, to put a large display thermometer on the wall in every laboratory and adjust it not to 24 7, but to 25 definitely, all the time. And this is also beneficial when you handle embryos for other purposes, because the fluctuation when you take the embryos out of the incubator is much lower. You may say it is not very convenient to work at 25 Celsius, I understand. But you are not the most important living being in an embryo laboratory. So you have to accept this compromise. It is still not 37 degrees. And then, of course, the bench, the stage temperature should be also 25 Celsius and the media temperature also. It is not as easy as supposed because warming requires several hours. everywhere up to today. Now we have to face some new challenges, the COVID era. Probably it can be handled. We had infective agents in the patients in the laboratory before, and we could successfully do it. Do it. So now a paper was impressed at human reproduction dealing with this problem and summarizing very well the possibilities, the chances, and the ways what we should follow, except for one thing. This paper disregarded one possibility. One new issue, the infection of liquid nitrogen before the vitrification, because it is airborne transmission. So at production, at distribution, at transportation, at storage, and even at the preparation for vitrification before it touches any biological material, it can be infected. And once the virus is in, it can be only removed by UV illumination, nothing else. So we had to add a letter to the editor calling the attention of people to this possibility. And I also use this option to call your attention to this possibility. And then the bench arrangement. But before I completely disappoint you, let's have a small pause. I owe you an explanation. I'm aware you expected a very different lecture, a more scientific one. Well, my approach is old fashioned or rebel for two reasons. One is a rational one. I am definitely not impressed by slight statistical differences when a little more attention could double the outcome. I'm talking about adjusting the temperature I'm talking about working quickly. And I am talking about not checking the embryos every single day during the development. Leave them alone. Of course, you may say, oh, just, just too many times, so interested and curious. And for register, I have to, what, what can it do? Two minutes, one minute. I am very quick. Yes. I agree, it will not make any harm. It will just kill your embryos on those sites. And I am annoyed to see papers publishing improvements where the improved results are below any standards, not speaking about the controls. I am bored of graphics, columns, flowcharts, linear regressions. I want to see obvious stunning differences in percentages and healthy, nice embryos under the microscope. 
And the second reason is more or less emotional. I know that in an IVF lab, you have to obey the rules, follow manuals, meet the requirements, perform the task, and strictly avoid mistakes. But is that all? Is this list summarizing the mentality, the approach of a caring parent towards the undefended, helpless baby? I know that documentation, witness and quality control, quality assurance, risk assessment, guidelines, grading, scoring, performance evaluation, certifications are all important. However, my primary goal is to make an environment where the most important thing is the oocyte and the embryo, and where the atmosphere is full of care, may I say affection and love. An environment that intrinsically helps to avoid mistakes and to achieve outstanding results. So back to the work again. A bench arrangement. I said the place should be dedicated to vitrification. I think that an embryologist should be also there who is dedicated to vitrification, who is professional, and who is fully focused on the work. And then everything required should always be there in exactly the same position. The pen, the paper, the pipette, the tip, everything. With closed eyes, you should find everything. And, sorry, not a single extra item. Preferably not a laminar docs, as I said before. But never, definitely never in a running animal box and never under a fan or AC flow. And the liquid nitrogen should be stored on a separate uh, well fixed bench. So aside of the uh, working bench, 15 centimeters lower than the workbench. Why? Because the liquid nitrogen is foam vapor just come float out from the box. And if it is on the top of your working bench, it cools down your embryos and all sides. You don't even feel with your hand, but the all sides, yes. And they suffer. And one suggestion also for good positioning, you should put this on the opposite side of the dominant hand. So if you are right-handed, the screen is mirroring, sorry. If you are right-handed, you had the pipette with the right hand. You had the con uh, carrier tool with the left hand. Make the drop or aspirate the outside and put it into the liquid nitrogen. And when you warm it, you just take it out with the container straw, cut the straw, take out the small carrier tool and immerse into the uh, warm medium. So not a single bad movement, very logical and very quick. And then people think, I think it is a sad story. And I cannot avoid to tell you, all the embryologists know what does it mean making the work with mouth pipettes. In fact, after two weeks of suffering, you will always find it extremely practical, precise, and nice, and cannot be replaced with handheld pipettes. So when regulations came that it is dangerous because of the infections port and back, we created a chamber in uh, Denmark uh, where a membrane separated the patient part and the uh, embryo part, absolutely safe. And we were with very few people, but we still used it up to recently. And now we have the COVID and we have to ha have the face mask. So it is impossible, but to tell you the truth, it was not a very nice thing to work for 10 hours with my pipette thing, but a little bit demanding and uh, disgusting as well. So in Denmark, we developed a tool that could replace it, a simple tool, an elegant tool, an easy tool, and it would work very well in each embryo lab and for 
15 years, I could not find a single producer, a, a developer, a company head who would deal with this idea. I have it, and now I put as a common treasure for everybody. I can share with everybody, but I need some help to get it realized. So, sorry, the time is a little bit running out, and I still have a lot of jobs to do. Uh, to talk about time frame handling, cooling, storage, warming, the irrigation culture. So I need some new solution, a new approach in this lecture and a new approach in our practice as well, including dealing with the background and including dealing with the troubleshooting and we have this new approach. So our intention at Vita Vitro is that we don't just sell media, devices, methods, techniques. We sell a compact system for both embryo production, vitrification, and all phases in a, an embryo laboratory. And we don't use just flyers, brochures, manuals, and guides or videos for propagating these methods. We need a personal coach. And of course, also we would like to, we cannot visit each laboratory individually, especially right now. So we have to make a virtual coach system and we did it. And it is the OPS application, a mobile phone application, which is available on iPhone and also on Android phones. And uh, what is inside? Just imagine an intelligent timer that tells you when to do, what to do, how to do, and why to do. The text, drawings, pictures, and videos on time. And in the waiting periods, periods, it provides you relevant background information. So what you have to do, sit to the microscope, start the app, and work as instructed by your coach. So this is available, free for everybody. And if you have some problem or suggestion, please turn to me personally. I am very happy to help you. Uh, just one thing remained, the choice again, cryotop and its clones or the OPS method. Of course, I am subjective, but there are some facts. They are almost the same regarding the age. What I have to tell you, the OPS is three years old, that it was the first. The media composition, it is the same, guess why. And the results, the results cannot be better. In fact, we have close to 100% survival with two sites and we use then great development, pregnancy and, uh, and uh, birth rate comparable with the fresh embryos or even better regarding the last two because of the better uterine environment. From some points, OPS produced better outcomes. It has much more first in the world achievements, including the uh, number of uh, innovative steps that we made first the uh, first baby the after oocyte vitrification with high speed method, the first baby after one cell embryo vitrification after uh, cleavage stage embryo vitrification, the OPS is still the best method for vitrifying human embryonic stem cells. And I also have to tell you in parentheses, in the animal world, the clones which were produced after cryopreservation of the embryo 
were almost exclusively produced after obsolitification, and the first one also was produced after obsolitification. So it qualifies in some way the OPS method. On the other hand, a very practical issue, the commercial media quality produced in Vita Vitro, in practically all parameters, evaluated by independent international official uh, laboratories are better than that of the competitors. And regarding the cryotop, the cryotop is also better in some things, including the numbers, the numbers of babies, the numbers of patients, the numbers of attempts, of course, because for 15 years, I had no way no possibility to commercialize it. So I am a late comer right now. And the same is applicable for the PR. So far. And finally, I also have to tell you that the OPS has some special benefits. The sample is more protected in the tube. And it is good than moving and packing. So when you put in the container straw, there is no chance for mechanical damage. Or why you make warming that says the embryos don't attach to any surface. So when you immerse them into the warm, warming medium, the sample just floats out calmly. And also it works with larger, more defined volume. At room temperature, there is no chance for evaporation. After cooling, there is no chance or very minimal chance for accidental warming. Additionally, you have some standard cooling and warming rates. If you use the cryotop, everybody makes some version. The manual says you have to remove all the solution for the surface, from the surface. So you just have to leave a small film covering the embryos. But I tried it many times. Results were inconsistent, probably due to the evaporations. And I talked to friends on conference dinners confidentially, and they also said that you should leave some solution, some solution. But how much? For a beginner especially, it may be difficult to find the right way. In the opposite, is no problem. I have to tell you that there is no negative effect of slightly lower cooling and warming rates as a consequence of a slightly higher volume. Everything is above 20,000 Celsius per minute, and it is more than enough. And additionally, it is easier to load, cool, pack, warm, and expel. And what is very important, and I have some definite uh, uh, testimonies from laboratories that easier to learn. For a beginner, definitely shorter time to reach the consistent acceptable result. So the choice is yours. It is up to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Very nice lecture. We have three questions, if you could answer them. First uh, is, what is the optimum concentration of cryoprotectant that is to be used for vitrification of immature oocyte? Mm -hmm. okay. Dr. Gabor. Could you, could you repeat it because I yeah. don't understand it. Yeah, what is the optimum concentration of cryoprotectants that is to be used for vitrification of immature oocytes? So the concentration of the cryoprotectant is almost a standard. 7.5, uh, 7.5 for mm -hmm. the uh, uh, equilibration medium for nine minutes or a little bit longer if required. And 15 or for the OPS, 16, 16% 16 for uh, the dehydration medium and 
plus uh, one more answer code to the one minute three two times plus the incubation or the transmission to the liquid nitrogen. So one minute in total uh, dehydration final step. It is almost exactly the same as uh, the difference is the additive material. We use BSA or serum uh, for animals, serum for humans, uh, human serum albumin. And uh, uh, the Kitazato right now uses uh, this uh, uh, other material as supplementation, uh, which is, uh, I don't think it is a really important difference. One more question from Dr. Jafar Ali. I am more inclined to use ethylene glycol to DMSO due to less comparative toxicity of the former demonstrated in mouse. What is your opinion on this matter? So you found uh, the DMS of toxic in mouse? Did you find it toxic in mouse? Sir, I think uh, he uh, he uh, he's mean to say that, I don't know, he's uh, writing that comparative toxicity of the former demonstrated in mouse, in DMSO. He's using DMSO. First of all, first of all, mouse is very different of humans. Mm -hmm. So it may happen that some things are different. Mm -hmm. According okay. to my opinion, uh, what we achieved in cattle, in pig, and also in uh, humans and in many other species, mm -hmm. at least 20, 40 species. Mm -hmm. DMSO cannot be replaced by any other cryoprotectant as a joint cryoprotectant with ethylene glycol. So this two is the winner. And if you think that uh, DMSO had some bad reputation, one reason why they say it is what I told you, that it may get toxic if you don't handle properly before the use. So if you use this DMSO, what we are talking about, so that you bought a liter mm -hmm. and put on the shelf, and time to time when you had to make vitrification, you just took out, put, uh, the medium, put in the medium and then put back to the shaft, closed it and left for several months again, and it will be killing the embryo. You have to know, I had half a year problem with this in the late 90s. It was very frustrating and then I realized that it happened and retrospectively I learned why. It oxidizes. You have to buy in dark ampoules and keep them in these ampoules until the final use. And when you make the solution, you can store this solution in the refrigerator, the vitrification solution for several weeks, but not the concentrated DMSO. So this is one reason. And the other reason why it has a bad reputation that it was used for dilent, for carcinogenic experiments. And uh, what has happened that DMSO neutralized the carcinogenic effect. So it made the solution healthier. That, that's why it was not good for the experimentation, the abelonic. And to people mind, it just came that DMSO is related with carcinogenesis. Nothing. Nothing, just a bad uh, explanation. So if you talk about an alternative, it is a propylene glycol. See, some companies use it. But combination of ethylene glycol with propylene glycol has never resulted in a stable system to vitrify human oocytes. One or two papers were published never repeated, never confirmed, and everybody uses DMSO and that even glycol.
and there is practically no third alternative. Thank you, sir. So now we uh, will move to our panel. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, uh, for your nice presentation and answers. So, Prana, please introduce other panel moderators. Thank you, Dr. Gavrovasta, for the, these excellent uh, golden nuggets of information. And now we'd like to move on to our uh, panel discussion for the evening. We are going to be having an exciting panel on optimizing vitrification outcomes. And for this panel, uh, we have our moderators, uh, Dr. Vijay Mangali, sir, and Dr. Goral Gandhi, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Vijay Mangali, I mean, uh, what can I say about him? He is one of the oldest uh, embryologists of India. He's, uh, a pioneer in since, and he has been associated with human IVF since 1986. He has held a lot of important uh, posts in the uh, Indian uh, Society of Assisted Reproduction, being the Secretary General of SR for years 2009 to 11, Chairperson of the Embryology SR for the years 2014 to 16, and has a lot of publications and presentations, and has been the recipient of Lifetime Achievement Award in 2017. So welcome, uh, Vijay Mangali, sir. Uh, I'd also like to welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Goral Gandhi, ma'am. And uh, we know uh, she's synonymous with crab reservation in India. Uh, so Dr. Goral Gandhi, she's the founder and scientific director at uh, Indo-Nippon IVF and uh, the ISRME uh, for imparting embryology and vitrification training and has earned her master's in uh, applied biology from King Edward Memorial Hospital and has extensive experience from uh, other international uh, facilities like Hammersmith Hospital London. She has uh, subsequently served, uh, uh, served as a research fellow at IVF Laboratory uh, in uh, the University of Hospital Belgium and Egyptian IVF Center, Cairo, and has extensive experience in the field of crab biology. Uh, she has uh, edited and uh, uh, published a book on vitrification, which is available via Springer, and has authored and co-authored a lot of publications in international and national journals. And her current passion and important uh, training in the field of ART is evident from uh, the uh, all of uh, the embryologist, uh, uh, training embryologists that she has trained, and she has uh, uh, trained over 500 embryologists. I'm pretty sure every center must have uh, had uh, some sort of hands-on training from Dr. Dr. Gandhi in one way or the other. So uh, without further ado, uh, welcome aboard, ma'am. And I'd like you uh, to introduce the panelists for the panel discussions. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pranay, for a nice introduction. And uh, I think I need to share my screen now. I'm trying to figure out how to start this. Yep. Now you can share. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so good evening friends and once again a very warm welcome to all of you. At the outset, I would like to congratulate the founder and organizers of IHERA for their wonderful initiative of imparting knowledge and thank them for inviting me. It is an honor to be here. Now, the topic for today's discussion is optimizing vitrification outcomes. This is an extremely important area because today more and more of embryo transfers across the globe are frozen embryo transfers. This can be for a variety of reasons, sometimes for better endometrial synchrony, sometimes for prevention of OHSS, or we may be waiting for PGT results to come in after the biopsy. There are many reasons, but the fact is that we are seeing more and more frozen embryo transfers than ever before. And I think the game changer here has been this wonderful technique called vitrification. Hence, it is very important to optimize our vitrification outcomes. But as Dr. Gabor Vashka has just mentioned in his lecture, there are so many things that can go wrong during vitrification. And as per Murphy's law, as he said, if anything has to go wrong, it will go wrong. But today we have a brilliant panel of experts here with us who are going to share their years of experience in vitrification and give us a lot of practical knowledge, tips and tricks to optimize our results. So I would like to welcome all of them 
and I would like to begin by introducing Sir Dalila Garcia. Dr. Esther has earned his Master's in Cell Biology and PhD in Genetics from the University of Barcelona and did a postgraduate course in Medical Genetics at the University of Berlin. She has over 15 years of experience in the field of ART and PG. She's a very positive, courageous, proactive, and curious person. All these qualities, along with her training in ART and genetics, has shaped her professional career into three key areas. First is outcomes. Second is direct labs. And now she's also responsible for the creation of ART and genetic centers globally, thus taking genetic techniques at large to the population. Apart from this, Esther is a very dear friend. I've spent some wonderful time training lab Barcelona. Welcome to the panel, Esther. It's so Next, I would like to welcome Dr. Gaurav Machundar. Gaurav needs no introduction to this audience. Everybody in India knows Dr. Gaurav Machundar, but here is a formal introduction. Gaurav earned his master's degree in clinical embryology from the National University of Singapore for his work in PGS for Enuploidy. Currently, he's the laboratory director at the center of IVF at Sir Gangaram Hospital, which is a very busy unit. Uh, he has successfully set up a PGS and PGD program, which now successfully also runs an in-house genetic Garu has been awarded the Economic Times Fertility Award for the Best Embryologist of the Year for in 2019. He has numerous international publications to his credit and he has contributed many chapters in textbooks. He's a joint treasurer of ACE and executive member of IFS India. Garu is one of the huge experience of PGD and vitrification is going to greatly benefit all of us today. Welcome, Gaurav. To Thank, the you. Thank you, Goral. Over to you, Vijay, to introduce and welcome Dr. Pranay Ghosh. Thank you, uh, Goral. Good evening, friends. We just listened to an excellent and very, very informative talk by uh, Professor Vasta, and I'm sure that the talk must have cleared most of our basic doubts. Well, though vitrification appears as a very simple procedure, there's a lot of science behind it, and it is necessary for us to understand the reasoning behind every aspect of vitrification to achieve consistent high uh, survival rates. Now, as a part of this next um, uh, unique webinar, which is exclusively dedicated to vitrification, we have a knowledge-packed panel discussion and with extremely learned and experienced panelists with us. Now, Goral I introduced two of them. The next uh, two, I have I have the privilege to introduce. We do need to introduce uh, Pranay Ghosh. We already uh, got his introduction. He is, he is a clinician turned embryologist. He is director of um, Elixir Fertility Center, New Delhi. Uh, he he is uh, very very um, uh, from from Maulana Azad Medical uh, College. He is a medical postgraduate, a very very well known institution in India. He got his masters in medical science in ART from Nottingham University. He has a diploma in reproductive medicine from the University of Kiel, Germany. He's trained in reproductive medicine at National University of Singapore, and he has fellowship in the minimal access surgery. And also he is an HRA certified clinical embryologist. Welcome, Pranay. Uh, coming to Dr. Nitin Lard, he's another gynecologist and embryologist. We have a panel, it seems, more clinicians turning into a, the embryologist. A medical student of the prestigious GS Medical College, Mumbai. I can say that because I am from the same college. He did his MD in OBGY uh, from another landmark institution in Mumbai, that is Wadi Hospital. Uh, after completing his DGO, DNB and uh, DFB, he acquired masters in clinical embryology from another prestigious institute of all time, that is National University of Singapore. I suppose uh, Professor Bongzo and Dr. Chan were their key faculties at that time, uh, great personalities. Uh, so since 1990, he's involved in ART with a lot of experience in all aspects of uh, human IVF. Welcome, uh, Dr. Nithi. Thank you. 
Uh, over to you, Goral. I think we'll start with the uh, panel. Let us straight uh, go to the first question because we're already running short of time. So uh, I would like to first invite Gaurav to tell us something about the significance of vitrification in today's ART practice. Vitrification has considerably changed the way we practice. And uh, Gaurav, can you throw some more light on how vitrification has impacted our practice today? Yeah, okay. Thank you, Goral. Um, so that's an that's important starting point for this panel. And uh, my take on it, vitrification is similar to what uh, people used to think about micromanipulation, uh, uh, you know, at the beginning of uh, the, the last two decades. And when a point was reached where people could not fathom having an IVF center without proper micro-manipulation facilities, I think now in today's ART setup, we are at a stage... Sorry? I'm audible, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so now we've reached a stage where it's one cannot uh, fathom or imagine an IVF lab without a robust vitrification facility. So the way we could not imagine an IVF lab without micro manipulation, the same goes for vitrification now. So that's, that's how important a part of IVF it is. And especially because we now know there is evidence, there is a strong evidence which suggests that uh, some, there, are, there are certain populations of patient where controlled ovarian hyperstimulation in a fresh IVF cycle uh, a transfer is not mandated because of endometrial asynchrony between the embryo and the endometrium. So vitrification became, uh, becomes very, very essential in these uh, patients. And hence, now it is unimaginable for me to do IVF without vitrification. So that's my take on vitrification. Absolutely. I agree completely. Vitrification has become such an integral part of and uh, next is coming to minimal stimulation and vitrification. We are seeing that minimal stimulation protocols today are becoming extremely popular. Now from the PGS studies, we know that minimal stimulation protocols give rise to better egg quality and in turn better embryo quality. And they are gentler on Professor, can you throw some light on the role of vitrification in minimal stimulation IVF? Are we justified in saying that vitrification is a cornerstone of minimal stimulation IVF? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, you know that from the past years to, to now, as you say, vitrification has uh, been one of the big, big changes in the IVF lab. We turn uh, out to to have bad results in uh, freezing embryos and other sites, and now with the vitrification, we have optimized a lot this this survival rate. And we has came out with a lot of solutions in terms of, for example, this mild stimulation uh, patients where you have to accumulate sometimes uh, a bunch of eggs from different uh, IVF protocols, uh, IVF cycles or you can decide to accumulate uh, embryos because you want to perform PGD and then you have to vitrify because PGD uh, results are going to transfer in a different cycle. So if we came out on the numbers, we've seen that we have uh, increased in 10 times the number of cycles that we vitrify in our labs. That means that sooner, most of the IVF cycles that we will perform will be uh, implies a vitrification or uh, eggs or embryos, but we'll have a vitrification in one of the steps. So that makes a huge uh, change in the lab. And, and it has been a lot of reports that um, uh, describe there is an increase in success rates and increase in accumulative pregnancy rates and safety of the techniques in the IVF if you use vitrification in, in one of the steps. So absolutely uh, vitrification with minimal simulation protocols it's one of the main parts that could be related. I mean, you, 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 can, you can do in the lab. Thank you, Isaac. Next, we come to the freeze-all policy. 
Now again, today we see many clinics opting for a 100% freeze-all policy. Uh, Dr. Nitin Lard, can you tell us something about the freeze-all policy? When do you decide to freeze all the embryos and defer the Over to you, Dr. Nitin. Yeah. Gaurav, am I audible? Uh, yeah, you are audible. Right. I can't see my own face over here. Yeah, neither can uh, you. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Everybody else can see him. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, your question is, in which condition we should offer freeze-all? Uh, well, uh, uh, in actually, when we do uh, IVF, the intention is to give a healthy baby to the healthy mother. But sometimes it so happened during stimulation, the patient lands with ovarian hyperstimulation. So under such situation, we will not like to make her life miserable by doing embryo transfer. So that is my first indication to do freeze all. That is a patient who is suffering from ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Second indication is while doing stimulation, if we come across that her, oh, her endometrium is not good, her, there is some collection in the endometrial cavity or endometrial thickness is not even 6.5 millimeter. In that case also, I will prefer to do freeze all policy. And in certain subgroup of patient, like where patient is, uh, where we intend to do PGD or PGS, here we will rather go ahead with the embryo biopsy, we'll freeze those all embryos, and in subsequent cycle, we will prefer to do frozen embryo transfer. And sometime patient who is having recurrent implantation failure, that is again a group of patient where I will like to freeze all the embryos, I will like to evaluate all the factors which is hampering her implantation and in subsequent cycle we will like to do frozen embry embryo transfer. Varal, I think I explained all the, I have given all the uh, reasoning. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you. Yes, so these are many, many factors where we need to freeze all the embryos and we have seen that vitrification, freezing them and vitrifying them and transferring them in a remote cycle gives wonderful results. Another very important area where vitrification has contributed tremendously is moving towards elective single embryo transfer. We know that multiple pregnancy is a major complication of IVF. We all end up transferring two, three embryos many a times and blend up with multiple pregnancy. But if we have an effective vitrification program, we can move towards elective single embryo transfer. Vitrification has helped us to do this, avoid multiple pregnancies. Pranay? Yeah, so uh, uh, I would like to confess that we are still not doing as many single embryo transfers as we'd want to, or as we were doing in uh, UK where we were mandated to. But still, uh, owing to vitrification, we have made a shift towards single embryo transfers. And I, I would like to say successfully for at least a subgroup of patients where we feel that uh, uh, it should be mandatory to uh, go ahead with a single embryo transfer because uh, we are now encountering a new concept where uh, we just want a single simulation for the patient and be done with it. So one and done policy, as you may say. And we, uh, there have been publications that have shown amply that if you go one plus one over successive, over cumulative cycles, it's better than a DET in a single cycle, uh, both in terms of maternal and neonatal outcome. So uh, personally, we started uh, towards a single embryo transfer policy for uh, a uh, separate patient subpopulation of ours, and these were young patients, less than 35 years of age, their first attempt, uh, no previous failures, patients who had a previous uh, child, patients in which we were confident that we did not have to lose, when we, this is when we started out. So we were confident that a single embryo transfer would not jeopardize the results because the, you know, the tendency is that uh, often, more often than not, patients have uh, do come to us with failures where they have had uh, double embryo transfers or even three or four embryo transfers uh, transferred if it is uh, the cleavage stage. So we, uh, when we started with a single embryo transfer policy with this, this particular patient subgroup of uh, previous cesarean, uterine anomalies, uh, second trimester losses, uh, where we felt that uh, 
a single image transfer would, uh, would be more justified and we got equivalent results. Uh, that's what propelled us and uh, uh, made us confident to go ahead uh, of, uh, for us to be able to offer the ESET policy to all our patients. But since, you know, uh, the patient uh, has a lot of say in deciding how many embryos to transfer, at least uh, at our center, so we involve the patient in decision making. And I'd like to uh, say that uh, uh, the multiple pregnancy rates are still uh, over 20%, uh, just about uh, over 20% at our center, which we would want to make it comparable to the international standard. We recently saw the HFPA uh, data regarding the outcomes with ESET over the years of 2017 and 18. And now, uh, owing to the ESET policy, they have successfully decreased the multiple pregnancy rate to less than 10% over all patients of populations. So uh, our aim should be a single embryo transfer for a majority of our patients so that we are able to cut down the uh, multiple pregnancy rate to what is uh, comparable to a natural pregnancy, which is over, over to the tune of two to three percent. And we should be very uh, wary of transferring two embryos for patients who are young, who are using uh, donated two uh, sites, because with such patients, the uh, double embryo transfer, the uh, multiple pregnancy rates are as high as 40 to 50 percent. So we should be very judicious about uh, transferring uh, more than one embryo. So uh, again, as you have already amply said, that uh, vitrification has uh, a robust uh, day five vitrification program has allowed us to do so, and we are trying to implement to the best of, best of our capabilities. Great. I think Gaurav, you wanted to add something? Yeah, so I, I just wanted to make a comment here. I agree with Pranay and I congratulate him for deciding to move towards uh, uh, elective single embryo transfer. And uh, just want to give out this message that like Dr. Gebor said, that now vitrification allows us uh, almost 100% survival rates. So when that is possible, then uh, ESET with vitrified embryos should not be a problem at all. And we are a center who've now shifted to 80% of our FETs in the, you know, in the previous years have been elective single embryo transfers, 80% of our FETs. And our data clearly states that there is very marginal increase between transferring two blastocysts and one blastocyst there is hardly a difference of only five percentage points in the implantation rates when two blastocysts are transferred as compared to a single blastocyst. However, with the just 20% patients where we transfer two blastocysts because of you know, various different reasons, the multiple pregnancy rate jumps from zero to 40%. So is it worth it? And this is, this is data which proves to be very useful in counseling patients by telling them that transferring two embryos is not leading to any increase in their chances of pregnancy, but it is making the chance of multiple pregnancy 40 times higher. So, so just wanted to get that comment in. Yeah, and also want to say that if you're making a shift towards like how what we did, if you're making a shift from double embryo transfer to single embryo transfer, don't be tempted to put a top quality embryo along with a poorer quality embryo because uh, now uh, the studies have shown that the incidence of vanishing twin syndrome, early miscarriages, is probably a little amplified if you are putting uh, suboptimal blastocysts along with top quality blastocysts. You have nothing to gain. You can su successfully make a shift from DET to SED and start with the select few subpatient uh, sub uh, subgroup that you have narrowed down. So you can go ahead with surrogate transfers, elderly uh, women who have medical uh, uh, complications. So these are prime candidates for single embryo transfers. And once you have results in these, you can make a shift towards like Gauravas, 80% of your transfers should be easy. Great, wonderful. I think that's a really wonderful message from our panelists that now it is very easily possible to start moving towards elective single embryo transfer. Gaurav, it's wonderful that we are also moving towards almost all elective single embryo transfers, except in you know very few cases where patients really insist on putting two embryos. So I think this is a message that we really need to get across to the patients, explain them this concept of cumulative pregnancy rates of you know transfer. 
and how the cumulative pregnancy rates work. And, and, the, so and, the, the onus, and the onus lies on the clinicians and the embryologists to explain this to the patient. Every patient comes saying that I want two or three embryos, but it is our responsibility to explain. Absolutely, absolutely 100%. I agree. Patients really depend decisions. So it is our responsibility to explain them this concept of single embryo transfers. Great. I Personally, I hate to see my embryos go to waste. So I don't like to transfer more than one embryo at a time. So great. Our panelists have really, you know, brought out so many factors where we can much more safer process than what it already is using vitrification, avoiding multiple pregnancies, avoiding OHSS uh, and, you know, taking, uh, having more minimal stimulation protocol and gentle stimulation protocol. So moving on to the next question, over to you, Vijay. Absolutely. I think that this is going to be a fantastic panel discussion. We had a great start. Um, Istar, I would like to come to you for before going on to the other technicalities of the vitrification, for the benefit of all our viewers who may be at the junior levels or at, at the mid-level or at the uh, senior levels as well. But it is absolutely important to understand first the basics and the science behind the uh, vitrification. So can you please uh, tell us a little bit about what is the effect of this infracellular cryoprotectant when it enters inside the cell? The uplasmic organelle rearrangements and the nuclear stability because we know that the vitrification is not just about the dehydration and maintaining the osmolarity but how different organelles within the uplasm mitochondria the golgi bodies the endoplasmic reticulums they react to the toxicity of the cryoprotectant because each one has different membrane structure uh, i can assure me that the the mostly the, the main damage that the cryoprotectants perform inside the, the cell are the crystal formation. And this crystal formation can break structures inside the cell and can damage all the intracellular organelles. So we have to be very careful um, uh, how we the process. And we have to, uh, uh, here I want to compare the slow freezing and the vitrification methods and how this crystal formation has been improved in terms of using the vitrification. We have to remember that when we use uh, the slow freezing, uh, the quantity of cryoprotectants that we use was less quantity than the ones that has in the vitrification. But at the end of the process, as we, uh, doing a slow freezing, the crystal formations were performed randomly inside the cell and were not controlled. At the end, the damage that this low quantity of uh, cryoprotectants were performed inside the cell were bigger at the end than the, the ones that we have uh, during the vitrification, that we're using higher number of cryoprotectants, higher quantity, but with less affectation. Also with the slow freezing, the process were automatic. That's a good thing because when things are automatic, you don't have this difference between uh, embryologists that can affect at the end the results. But the bad thing of that is that we couldn't control where this uh, crystal uh, uh, formations were uh, performed and, and, and the affectation of those. With the, with the vitrification, this part is completely manual and we can control precisely uh, the time of the, of the crystal formation appearance. Slow freezing were taking, takes hours, vitrification takes minutes, and the results at the end with the slow freezing was an increased rate of damage in the cellular damage in our sites and blastocysts and with the vitrification is, is a, a slow down. So the, the important part here is that to be careful about what we have in our hands. Uh, as I said, vitrification will have higher levels of protection that can damage, but if we do it in a, in a proper way and we are very stick to the protocols, we can control that. Mainly, I, I could say that mainly is, is this, that we, the crystal formation were completely random and it could break any intracellular uh, structures. That's the main result. Absolutely too. And as uh, Professor uh, Gabbard has mentioned in his talk, that not to worry unnecessarily about the carcinogenic effect of the DMSO because it depends on the concentration and the way it enters uh, into the cell. In the same line, can we safely say that different organelles or even different cells, they react differently to the cryoprotectant. They, they, get, they, enter, they allow the entry of the cryoprotectant, but still 
the whatever minor uh, maybe the damage we can say it must be happening inside it is already uh, they have the capacity to get get it repaired because otherwise we, we would not have got uh, survival and viability we would not have retained the viability on the same point why the efficacy uh, of the vitrification it varies between the sperms uh, oocytes and the embryos that is uh, can you briefly uh, explain it uh, esther we have to consider that oocyte, uh, what is the structure of a sperm, what is the structure of an oocyte and the embryo. We have an oocyte that's a very big structure with a lot of cytoplasm and a small membrane related to the cytoplasm. And this, this is completely opposite to the sperm, where we have huge membrane surface comparing to intracellular, uh, intracellular organelles or intracellular uh, or cytoplasm. So the effect could be completely different and will be completely different. Uh, as we consider that when we are putting the eggs or the embryos inside a solution, a vitrification solution, where the osmolarity outside is probably 10 times bigger than the osmolarity inside the cell, with, in that moment is when the, the medium, the dehydration of the, of the cell, the water from inside comes outside, and this, the water comes outside to the membrane plasmine. plasmine. So it's not the same velocity that will happen that on a sperm than in our side. Because the surface, comparing to the quantity of liquid that it has to take out, is completely different. And then they have to equilibrate. The cryopotentin will have to come inside. It's a, not, it's a reverse position, it's a reverse effect. And this will also affect the same. It's not, it will not take the same time to equilibrate that uh, cell in our side than in a sperm. That's, has a completely uh, different ratio. Is why your sites are the most loving uh, structures in life for the vitrification. And apart from that, it's, they have a nuclear state that it's, uh, 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 it's, it's very, very, very loving. I mean, it's one stage that one error, one break, the nuclear states in our site can affect the, me the meiosis and the mitosis procedure uh, at the end. Uh, but taking into consideration the structure of the cell, you can see that they are completely different. And the way of the cryopotentins will affect and the concentrations and the times that we need to use in each uh, type of cell has to be completely different. Absolutely. We, can, we cannot speed up vitrification. This time we cannot speed up and we cannot slow it down because if you, we slow down uh, a lot this, this period, we will have some toxic, uh, toxic effects with the vitrification. So it's a, it has to be a, 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 a balance. Absolutely true. Absolutely true, Esther. And we are going to uh, have a little bit detailed um, uh, discussion about this, how to modify our techniques depending upon the cells that is uh, that we are going to deal with. Uh, coming to you, Gaurav, uh, can you please explain it whether there is basically need to sterilize the liquid uh, nitrogen when, while doing vitrification? And if yes, then which is the most practical way to sterilize the liquid nitrogen for the vitrification? How do you sterilize, even the next part is, how do you sterilize the liquid nitrogen storage tanks and how often? Because these are some practical things which everyone should know in the laboratory. Yeah, well, this is, uh, this is a recent trend where a lot of emphasis is being placed um, you know, on the risk of disease transmission uh, through liquid nitrogen, mediated through liquid nitrogen. Uh, however, the solutions are uh, not very uh, practical or effective. Um, so like Dr. Gebor uh, already mentioned, that the, perhaps the most effective form of killing any form of virus or bacterial or microbial contamination in pre-existing tanks with liquid nitrogen is UV sterilization. That's what works. Um, there are now new methods, new devices being introduced into the field. Uh, there are filters available, the PTFE filter, which is a 0.22 micron filter. So there are groups where they have suggested filtering small amounts of liquid nitrogen with this filter. Then there's a new device called the clean liquid air. However, uh, we need to understand that in order to either sanitize or uh, sterilize uh, uh, liquid nitrogen DVAR or liquid nitrogen, uh, we need to make sure that the container is empty. And that itself poses a huge risk uh, in shifting uh, uh, embryos and straws and uh, gametes 
And uh, as far as the solutions are concerned, uh, hydrogen peroxide can be used, three to 6% or uh, uh, alcohol can be used and then later on rinsed with water and or any common detergent, you know, 10% strength in water can be used. So these are used and uh, it's been recommended that, you know, at least once a year, the liquid nitrogen tanks uh, could be uh, uh, disinfected or cleaned. However, there are huge question marks about the, uh, you know, the practicality of actually doing this. Now that we have multiple tanks and thousands of embryos in each tank, so it, it's a huge task. Right, absolutely true, uh, Gaurav. Uh, but one more important point that you had mentioned is while doing the sterilizations or the UV. Uh, uh, exposure. The tank has to be empty. There should not be embryos into that one and that is the main aspect. So you should have practically one spare tank while cleaning and while sterilizing the another one. This is a very important aspect. I think in UK it is a law that you cannot have a laboratory. They don't sanction it unless and until in your vitrification or the, crude or the freezing system you have an empty uh, storage tank to you know take out the uh, all the embryos or the cells that you have and then do the necessary uh, sterilization absolutely true uh, well next question is to dr nitin uh, lard dr nitin this is related to something about the protocols while doing the beautification do you prefer a single step one step or a multi-step uh, protocol and do you like to follow the the instructions as given by the manufacturer or you it is possible for us to slightly make the modifications when you uh, do the vitrifications. Yeah, Dr. Vijay, uh, in my practice, uh, uh, when we do a vitrification, the idea is to cut short the time and also do a freezing process whereupon you are taking care of the critical temperature that is plus 15 degree to minus 5 degree. That is the time where intracellular ice crystal formation happens. So we want to avoid that. And with, by, with the help of vitrification uh, technique, we can achieve that. However, for that, you need a high concentration of cryoprotectant. So the high concentration cryoprotectant per se is also embryotoxic. So we need to reduce the toxicity of cryoprotectant. So there are two techniques by which you can do that. One is you are you should perform all your vitrification procedure at a lower temperature. And second, instead of one cryoprotectant, add more than one cryoprotectant, preferably a combination of permeable and non-permeable cryoprotectant. So if I do all these maneuver in single step, the risk of having a osmotic shock to the embryo will be high. And therefore, I normally prefer instead of one step, two step procedure in which in first step I do equilibration. I make sure that there's adequate equilibration has taken place. And in step two, they, whereupon I increase the concentration of cryoprotectant and then suddenly and quickly then we plunge this embryo inside the liquid nitrogen tank. So this is how, uh, this is the reason why I prefer instead of one single step, we go for double step technique. And the second question, whether you would like to do some adjustment from in a given vitrification media. The vitrification media contains, the volume is so less, the viscosity is so high, and one need to be very quick. So if I modify some, some, uh, some thing, then the risk of, again, osmotic shock and also risk of ice crystal formation will be high. So I will not like to do any adjustment than what is recommended by the manufacturer. Okay, right. Absolutely true. Uh, Guru, uh, can you take the panel discussion further? Okay. So, uh, great, Dr. Lad. That's a wonderful message that we shouldn't be modifying the protocols on our own. We have whichever system we are using, we have to follow the because these protocols are devised, as we have heard in Dr. Gabor's lecture, these are Dr. Gabor and many other scientists, they are all pioneers in the field of vitrification with decades of research, they have devised these protocols. So we shouldn't be modifying without understanding the reason behind each and every step. Uh, 
to ask you to give us some tips to optimize the protocol because there may be some chances we are saying that we must follow the exact protocol but there must be many small tips and tricks that are probably not mentioned or you know with your years of experience probably you can share some tips with us how to optimize the protocol yes sir yes uh, yeah absolutely absolutely i mean when you have a when you have a protocol to follow most uh, in general you have some uh, pipetting and change of media and step by step what you have to do but there are little things that we have to consider because most of the errors that happen in the lab sometimes are because uh, embryologists get nervous embryologists uh, probably uh, I, I like what uh, Gabor but says before that uh, vitrification is not a social event because sometimes when someone is uh, doing vitrification procedure, someone came and asked something, and vitrification doesn't, uh, you cannot have any second of distraction during the process. So most of the problems that came out during the vitrification of towing sometimes are mainly handy, handy uh, things. So here mm -hmm. I, I, have some tip. I have some general tips, but that can work for uh, different kind of methodologies that you are using. For example, it's important to know which focus plane uh, you have to use. If you are moving one oocyte or one embryo from one media to another media that has different, different osmolarity, you will know in advance that this oocyte, this, this uh, biological uh, part will float and will go down and will move uh, during the uh, inside the solution. So you have to plane with the focus plane. In order to avoid doing that and then avoid, to avoid, the, the, avoid the risk of losing the, the oocyte or the embryo, it's always recommended to use lower magnification uh, focus plane. And then when the uh, oocyte or the embryo are completely stable and you want to see really if they could recover the structure or not and how it will, uh, will be at the end, then use a, a big one. But one of the main errors is to use a bigger magnification when you are changing the first step to the other side. The second, uh, the second uh, problem could be uh, going to aspiration. Remember that if you are changing from media to media, and this media has different, uh, so, uh, different uh, osmolarity as well, you have, uh, if you take a little bit of media of the second step, of the second uh, well um, inside the capillary, that will be uh, one thing that will um, help you in order that inside the capillary, the oocyte will be starting doing the procedure. So when you place it on the medium, it will be more stable. If not, it will be, uh, it will be more chalk. Great. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. I think this magnification tip is really a very, very valuable tip. It is a mistake that and I also tell everybody that, you know, your one hand while vitrification has to remain on focus because you have to keep on adjusting the focus all the time while vitrification. So these are, you know, for all the participants, a very, very important tip to remember is about which magnification to use at which point. Yeah. Can you move the other one, please? Sir? Can, ah, okay. Uh, another, thing, uh, another thing is, uh, I always say that the embryologist has to ask herself or himself why I'm doing that and what I have to expect from the cell of the embryos to, to feel or to, to respond. Because um, it's not one, sometimes it's not a rule that we have to follow. It's a rule that we have to follow, but something has happened there and it's, happen it's happening for something. So imagine that uh, during our outside, the first step on the vitrification solution, you know that in advance that the outside will have to drink and then it has to be recovered. So it's very important to know in advance to, to figure out the distance between the zona pellucida, the, the, between the, the cell membrane and the, the zona pellucida, in space, space, what is at the beginning and what will be in the, in the, at the end. Because when we are handling a lot of all sides or a lot of embryos at the same time, the worst scenario that could happen is when we have all these frozen, when we have to assign this X to a recipient. And if we haven't considered if the all side has response properly or not to the vitrification step, we can assign a, a number of X that could 
uh, results in a low quality of uh, survival rate. So if you take into account that and you know what is happening egg by egg and how the egg is responding and how is the periphery in space after the vitrification solution, you can have an idea of the quality of the site that you are vitrifying. Uh, and then when you have to assign these eggs to a recipient, probably if you have two eggs that has response in a not proper way, you can be uh, so, uh, a third one, just to be sure that you will have enough eggs of good quality for this. So it's a way that we have to see what we are doing. Note, I will recommend to take notes of what is happening. And also, uh, be careful with the times. Uh, every protocol uh, has its rules. But, uh, but for example, in Kyotet, uh, there are a maximum time that you have to remain the or, so or the embryos in the first step. But it's a maximum one. If you see that in after eight minutes, the outside of the embryo has recovered perfectly, there is no need to keep these uh, cells into a medium that could be and toxic. Let's go away, move, up, move on and do uh, and follow the, the steps. So don't, don't be a stick. important following the step because they mentioned that the end step is when the shape is recovered. So you don't need to wait for those four fifteen 15 minutes. Wonderful. These are wonderful tips, sir. And I, I think that even while uh, astrocyst, if we observe how they are shrinking in ES, it tells us a lot about its future implantation potential. So, you know, probably you can choose while E set, you can choose your blastrocyst according to the way it had, it has behaved in uh, wild vitrification, if you take notes of all these things. You can, you, if you are, um, if you take that into consideration, you can, uh, con you can vitrify, you, co you can put the whole side that has less quality in one show and keep it aside and keep it completely marked and knowing that that's not properly, probably uh, it's, it's not going to go farther on the top of the procedure. Because if not, if you mix it and you don't take these notes and you mix it, then it could be a disaster. Right. Another, another important thing is bubbles. Uh, embryologists, we don't like bubbles, I know. Uh, bubbles are bad and can, uh, can make that the outside of the embryo gets sticking to the bubble. And when we see a bubble, we try to take the bubble out. We don't have to do that. Uh, it's, I, I would recommend to, remain, to, to keep it there. The bubbles will go in a, in a side of the, of the well and will remain there. Don't, don't mess with the bubbles because if you mess with the bubbles, you are increasing the risk of the outside of the embryo get to stick into the bubbles and lose, and lose it forever. Another thing that uh, some of the biologists, uh, biologists has a lot of problems is placing the outside on the device. Uh, for example, in Cryotop, on the Cryotop media, they recommend to aspirate the medium as maximum as possible to make, to, to put the embryo on the other side in the less quantity of medium the device before submerging that into the liquid nitrogen. On the cryotech, for example, uh, as the cryopotential are not as, as, as higher as the as kitathato, uh, they don't recommend that. But we, as embryologists, we tend to put the site on the first draw. Uh, I always say, don't worry about that. Just make drops and it came out. Don't worry. Don't, because if not, you, are, you, you could be losing time trying to adjust the outside on the first drop on the device. And it's a time that is very precious. So you don't have to lose that time for That doesn't mind if the outside, uh, you leave it on the tip, tip, tip of the device or you leave it a little bit farther. Uh, as if you know that and you know where you, you put the outside, it's okay. But don't make, don't lose this precious time that doesn't serve for anything. If, and, and the last one, I think I have another one. Go down. Hello? I think you need to share your screen again. It got unshared. Okay. I can share mine. Hello? Oh, well, I can share mine, never mind. Yeah, yeah. 
what is doing it actually? And uh, one of the last thing is that uh, one of the, the more critical steps, I could say, it's uh, 37 degrees uh, towing uh, medium, the TS. That's the mandatory. Uh, as what I say, temperature is, is crucial, it's mandatory. And when we say 37 degrees, it says, we say 37 degrees at the time you put the straw inside the, the medium. Uh, I have seen in some labs that uh, they have this TS uh, on an incubator, the incubator is far away from the hood, and it takes some seconds that from the, they take out the TS from the incubator to put the, uh, the TS into the well and to uh, insert the straw. During that few seconds, probably the temperature is not 37. When you put the straw, the temperature is 36 point something, and that could be detrimental for the, for the towing procedure. So uh, I always recommend to measure really with a, with a proof the temperature of the TS after you perform all that. And if you see that, and you see that doing all this manipulation, you lose 40, 4, 4 degrees, for example, I, uh, 0 0.4 degrees, probably your incubator will have to be, in order to be at 37, it has to be at 38. In order that, that when you submerge the straw, this straw has to be at 37. So well, these kind of things, you have to be very careful. When you, we say that this medium has to be at 37, it's 37 at the time, we do the procedure, not uh, during all the time. Okay, thank you, Esther. These are wonderful tips, absolutely great tips that are going to help us. Can I share my screen? Yes. The main difference between open and closed system is that in open system, the gametes come in direct contact with liquid nitrogen before capping it securely, whereas in closed system, this direct contact is avoided. And there are some concerns except expressed by some workers about possible concerns over safety. Wonderfully explained this aspect in his lecture, but I would like to have everybody's opinion. And I would like to ask Gaurav that is this concern over safety? Is it really justified? And what about the effectiveness of both the systems for oocytes and gastrocysts? And which method preferred? Well, Goral, uh, Goral, we use, uh, in our laboratory, we use the open system. And uh, uh, Dr. Gabor, uh, uh, he put it very nicely when he said in his presentation that uh, out of millions of transfers which have happened in the world in open systems, not a single case has been reported till date. So I don't need to say anything Absolutely. else. Yeah, I don't need to say anything else. We know that closed system, again, the advocates of closed system have always emphasized uh, on the risk of disease transmission mediated by liquid nitrogen. And so for them, uh, the choice of closed system is a safer choice, a theoretically a safer choice and it's it's putting the straw or the device in a device or a straw in a straw principle the main advantage is that it's supposed allegedly safe approach uh, if we compare it with uh, open systems then there are uh, two important differences one is the only the cooling rates may get affected in a closed system as compared to an open system However, the warming rate is not, uh, uh, should not be affected uh, if comparing both the systems. So if anything, if anything, then probably uh, oocyte vitrification will be affected, uh, uh, you know, owing to cooling rates. But since I don't have any practical, uh, you know, uh, experience with closed systems, this is, this is what the, you know, the latest reviews uh, and the, the papers say. However, what is important, the message that I want to give out to people, especially during the COVID pandemic, is that there have been a lot of recommendations for uh, use of, for shifting to closed systems uh, during this COVID uh, pandemic and the time, you know, uh, after this time. So, however, uh, one should be very careful and cautious 
because uh, before adopting any new system in your laboratories, uh, make sure that the system is well validated in your laboratory and only then make a shift uh, towards a new system. Absolutely. Uh, is any of our panelists want to comment on this question? Any comment, any inputs from anybody? So I think we all agree that, uh, I think we also need to look at the way the virus transmits in liquid nitrogen. I don't think a virus can, you know, jump from a vitrified straw into a next straw. So this transmission, it has been shown, if we see the belsin paper in Crab Biology 2000, that this, you know, this kind of virus transmission in liquid nitrogen tanks is almost impossible. So as Dr. Gabor has mentioned, I think we need to use a bit of a pragmatic approach in So coming to cooling and warming rate, we know that for successful vitrification, we need to have very, very high cooling and warming rates. And uh, you know, scientists have worked for years and years in, for developing methods that can achieve these very high cooling and warming rates. They've developed the minimum volume cooling methods to give us very high cooling and warming rates. So Dr. Pranay, can you some light the importance of cooling warming rates and high rates. And I would also like to ask you, according to you, what is more crucial to survival, high cooling or high warming rates? And what is the single most important factor affecting survival? Dr. Pranay. So uh, thank you for the question. Uh, we have amply heard that uh, the majority of the ice crystal formation will occur during the cooling and the warming. And it is precisely this that we want to avoid. Uh, so first of all, if I uh, were to address the cooling rates, uh, they're important, no doubt. Even though now everybody, all of us know that the warming rates are more important than the cooling rates, but the uh, cooling rates are also, uh, they need to be sufficiently high to have adequate cryo survival. Uh, when I listened to the experience of the junior embryologists who are struggling to achieve good cryo survival, mm -hmm. they mentioned that uh, it is the final 30 to 60 seconds in the vitrification solution where they are not able to achieve a balance between uh, having the right focus, uh, be able to pick up the embryos in the stipulated time, put on the cryo device and aspirate the uh, excess of the cryo protectant. And therefore they have to uh, compromise on one or the other. So probably they'll take either longer time or not be able to aspirate excess of the media or uh, even lose out a, a, a couple of, uh, from, from the, uh, one of the embryos because of the differential floating uh, of the embryo exhibit in the vitrification solution. So one of the, we know when uh, we are doing vitrification as compared to slow freezing, we are directly plunging after uh, putting the embryo in the cloud device, we are putting in the liquid nitrogen and we are able to achieve higher cooling rates. But uh, what is important is to uh, achieve a uh, balance between optical clarity, knowing precisely where your embryos are, your magnification, uh, especially during the uh, last few steps, the vitrification step, and be able to uh, aspirate, uh, especially in the case of em embryos in blastosis, the excess of the media. So for, uh, and to quote Dr. Gaber, I mean, I think uh, how I made a shift towards um, uh, a successful cross of uh, vitrification was to uh, have some sort of device which would hold the cloud device in uh, a particular uh, position so that at least the vibration error of my hand would be eliminated. And now the commercially available crowd plates, uh, uh, especially the Kita Zeta and the crowd top are able to successfully uh, negate the vibration that the at least the trainee embryologist, junior embryologist encounter while loading. So that's one step. So my uh, point uh, being that the last few 30 to 60 seconds, uh, there's a lot of interplay between the toxicity, the timing and the uh, loading. And so you need to focus on each and everything to be able to perform a plunge into the liquid nitrogen in a timely manner. That being said, uh, warming is uh, the uh, more, uh, warming step is the more important step because we know that the intracellular ice crystal formation 
uh, is likely to occur to a higher extent for a given solution uh, as compared to uh, the cooling step. And it is precisely because of this uh, uh, argument that the proponents of closed system overtification, uh, they uh, say that they are able to achieve similar cryo survival because even though the cooling rates are lower with the closed systems, the warming rates are, uh, are approximately of the same order. So um, the first minute of warming or the thawing is crucial in terms of you uh, having the precise temperature for the right, uh, the embryos being exposed to the first solution for the right time, uh, so that you are able to avoid the toxicity and so that you don't uh, uh, fiddle with the embryos, you don't touch them. So how we have been able to optimize the first step over and of the what is written in the protocol is uh, in our practice, we use the entire volume that is uh, uh, designated for the thawing step, the warming step. So we don't compromise on that because uh, you may be able to use smaller volumes of uh, thawing solution or the warming solution, and its impact may not be immediately uh, apparent in terms of cryo survival. All your dust mills will be fine or your blastocysts will be fine, but they might be downstream effects that we are not uh, aware of. Uh, so. Uh, so my foremost point being that don't compromise on the manufacturer's recommended volumes because the moment you are plunging, taking out your crowd device from the liquid nitrogen and plunging in uh, the bombing solution, there's a temperature change and that temperature change is going to be much more pronounced if you are not using 4 ml and using either 1 ml or 0.5 ml or 250 microliters. I've seen bombing being done in uh, drops as well. Second uh, point being uh, use a preheated uh, petri dish in which we are doing the warming. So we use petri dishes along with aluminium blocks that are able to maintain the temperature of the petri dish at 37 degrees. And the third small tweak that we have uh, learned over the year, uh, years is not to waste time in pipetting out the thawing solution from the uh, vial into the uh, uh, petri dish. Just simply pour out the contents of the thawing solution from uh, the uh, non gas incubator into the uh, petri dish and just uh, be quick about it. So uh, that's how you are, you'll be able to achieve a very high warming rate if you first and foremost stick to the manufacturer's recommended volume. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Pranay. These are really great. section at my end is really very, very unsafe. I apologize for that. So we all agree that this, uh, the first step of thawing is really very, very important and crucial and it is, it can become one of the most rate limiting step affecting the survival. Over to you Vijay for the next question. Thank you uh, Pranay for the elaborative you know, details that you have given. Um, on again, uh, Dr. Nitin, I would like to ask you one practical question that what is the preferred stage of the embryo vitrification and why do you think so that a particular stage is more beneficial and is there any difference in the outcome when you choose uh, right from two cell to hatching blastocyst or a hatch blastocyst does it have any clinical relevance hello yeah no. yeah yeah vijay if you look at the conventional ivf treatment we have realized that blastocyst transfer gives us better success rate. That is simply because it is a physiological and the blastocyst and endometrial synchrony takes place in the stage of blastocyst stress transfer. The same rule can be applied when it comes to the freezing of the embryo. So blastocyst freezing should be ideal. But however, in the recent past, we had our own reservation when we were talking about blastocyst stage freezing, mainly because of its size, multicellular nature, and a large amount of blastocyst present within the blastocyst. And therefore, a lot of people had uh, their reservation saying that probably the ice crystal formation will be very high in blastocyst stage uh, freezing. And therefore, they recommended that in case if you really want to do blastocyst uh, freezing, you will have to remove the blastocyst either by mechanical or with the help of laser. However, 
a lot of uh, literature now suggests that a good blastocyst also carries a very good uh, permeability between two cells. And in case if you keep this blastocyst in a vitrification media, the uh, you can see practically the blastocyst fluid comes out very easily. And now with our hand, we have we have seen the success rate is far better even compared with the uh, cleaving embryo. That is one thing. Second thing, another advantage of blastocyst stage freezing is you end up doing only few blastocyst freezing unlike a cleaving embryo. Uh, practically, your workload reduces by almost one third or one fourth time. Because in cleavage embryo, like till a, a eight cell stage, since the embryonic activation has not taken place, so all these embryos look alike. So, uh, for workload wise also blastocyst freezing will be better and uh, for even for result also it is better and even with regard to physiology it will give us a better success rate. So uh, in my practice we do strictly blastocyst freezing these days and we are very happy with the uh, clinical pregnancy rate even the survival rate about the uh, blastocyst stage. As regard to your question too uh, what is my experience about the hatching blastocyst? Uh, well, unfortunately, I really have got no experience. So I will rather like to ask the same question to the other esteemed panelists. I want their experience. Okay. Um, I think there is... I think no... is going to cover this. Yeah, cover this one. So uh, in, my, in my experience, I can tell you that there is no difference. We can have the same efficiency as far as the uh, expanded blastocyst or the hatching blastocyst is concerned. Um, Esther, can you just throw some light on, do you want to change the protocol uh, while you, when you vitrify the oocytes or day-to-day -day embryos or the expanded blastocyst? And uh, what are the major changes that you may like to apply? I could say that uh, I don't like to, to make uh, big changes or, or any change on the protocol. So as I said before, you have to consider the size of the cell that you are vitrifying. If you are vitrifying an oocyte or blastocyst that has huge, uh, higher volume comparing to an embryo, uh, it's logic that it uh, needs more time to get uh, the clear protections inside than a clear rate uh, inside. So I, uh, I stick to the protocol in terms of uh, uh, higher rates of um, Vitrification uh, times the, for all sites of blastocysts and less for, for embryos. In terms of uh, blastocysts, in terms of blastocysts, I prefer to, to collapse the blastocysts, and I have another slide for that, uh, to collapse the blastocysts before uh, vitrify those, because it's a way that we are speeding the time that uh, they have to take all the water outside. If you have a huge expanded blastocyst, will not be the same as uh, as uh, early blastocyst. But uh, this is on the principle that I said before. You have to consider how much volume is a cell and how many water is inside and what this cell needs to be, needs, needs to, to have, right? So if you have a blastocyst, a huge blastocyst with a very big blastocell uh, that has to, this uh, blastocell uh, liquid will have to come out from the blast from the blastocyst, right? Before, before uh, doing the vitrification uh, step to, um, and getting inside the pre protectant. So if you remove that uh, liquid uh, from the blastocell before or you collapse it and you uh, are able to remove it, then you are shortening the time for the pre, uh, pre protectant to go inside and calibrate the. Collapse the blastocyst using laser, or you you use the uh, medium for it. Dep depending in our lab, we use the laser because we use laser for the for the PGT. So if we have a blastocyst, uh, if we have a blastocyst uh, that performs PGT, they already are completely uh, collapsed when you are taking out the trophectoderm. If you see that after taking out the trophectoderm. The blastocell uh, doesn't um, collapse as much as possible. You can, with the needle, you can remove a little bit, or you can make another pulse of the of, with the laser. But you can also uh, do it mechanically with the PZD needle, or you can do it chemically. That doesn't matter. The important thing is that 
uh, depending the tool that you have in the lab, uh, you just, you can use one or another and be quick. Thank you. Over to you, Goral. I think we have to go a little faster. Yeah. So coming to blastosis vitrification, Gaurav, we have spoken a lot about blastosis vitrification. So first, I want to ask you, when do you freeze? Day five, day six, say if, you know, if an embryo is an early blast on day five, do you freeze it on day five or do you want to wait till day six till it becomes a blastocyst? What do you do, Gaurav? See, we, we, we can freeze on any of these days. Uh, However, we just wait for an uh, embryo to have uh, as many cells as possible before we take a decision to freeze it. So, which means that we, we want it to grow. And what about hatching? Hatching, uh, uh, hatching again, we... Sorry, like, sorry, you, I, sorry, I interrupted you. Go we, ahead. We, we, we want to do artificial collapse of the cavity, especially because the media that we are using, uh, the manufacturers, they recommend uh, the time frames which have been given uh, for vitrification have been given according to the fact that the blastocele is uh, is minimal. And um, uh, as far as blastocyst collapse is concerned in 2016, this paper, uh, it was an important paper, they showed that artificially shrinking uh, the blastocyst, it helps in increasing the survival rate. Uh, so this was for a particular manufacturer uh, and media system, but they showed that artificial shrinkage, uh, it helped um, again in 2017 in Geneva, uh, uh, Hu uh, Hubert Joris, he presented uh, and he, they published in Human Reproduction where they showed that collapsed blastocysts led to a higher survival rate as compared to non-collapsed blastocysts. Uh, however, uh, what is... Uh, um, so we also follow the same in our laboratory, like Esther said, we collapse the blastocyst and this gives uh, two important uh, advantages. Uh, one, they have actually shown in 2018 in a, in a very interesting paper on RBM online, where they have shown that uh, after warming, artificially collapsed blastocysts re-expanded more rapidly than intact blastocysts. So that is a good marker when you're doing a FET. So if the blastocyst was collapsed to start with, that will initiate a faster re-expansion. And, uh, and we know that that is now an important marker of blastocyst viability. So that is something to take account of. And like I said, uh, you know, depends on, so if the, if the manufacturer has recommended uh, the use of, uh, you know, artificial shrinkage, then that should be followed uh, because the time frames which have been given are then in accordance with the, you know, the shrinkage. So, so that's, uh, so like, like now, um, that's exactly what I'm saying. So, um, so yeah, so, so that's why we, we follow artificial shrinkage because it suits us. Right. So I think uh, you also agree that you do artificial shrinkage. What about you, Pranay? Would you like to add something on hatching? Yeah. So ours has been a funny journey along the slope of learning uh, vitrification and uh, especially a blastocyst for and uh, achieving good cross survival for uh, blastocyst. And uh, somewhere down the line, we uh, had this in our mind that those blastocysts that are fully expanded, the ones that are about to pop. When we uh, follow the manufacturer's guidelines of not collapsing the blastocyst, they somehow did not fare very well. Uh, and sure enough, uh, down the line, three years down the line of our usage, we got uh, an advisory from the uh, manufacturer that in case your blastocyst size is more than 220 micron, you probably would fare better if you were to collapse the blastocyst. And this is something that uh, we had realized before uh, we got this notification from the uh, manufacturer. So previously we believed that the longer equilibration times would uh, help us to negate the effect of non not collapsing the blast skill, but that was not the case. We were uh, struggling between 85 to 90% for these uh, fully expanded popping blastocysts. And we were uh, collapsing these, but now 
uh, sure enough, after this uh, advisory, we have started collapsing our blasters in a, in a different way. We are not no longer using laser for collapse. We are using the chemical method that has been uh, forwarded to us, and we use a mixture of DS and WS in a particular ratio. And uh, we feel that it, it is a little less lesser invasive uh, technique to collapse the blasters, and uh, we are doing well. For three A's and four A's, we don't need to uh, collapse because our car survival otherwise was good enough. So we are not collapsing uh, uh, anything lesser than 200 microns. Okay, so you collapse only those which are greater than 220 microns. So great, these are this is extremely helpful. And uh, when do you transfer the blaster cyst after warming? How long do you wait? So we wait two hours. What has been advocated and it's, again, for somebody who's beginning to venture out into plasticine vitrification and warming, they would do well by waiting, especially if they have collapsed the blastocyst. Because, uh, you know, the immediate post-warming uh, blastocyst morphology may be very ambiguous and it will probably not give us a lot of information whether we would uh, be better off uh, not transferring the, this blastocyst and throwing out more or whether this, this one would do it for it, this particular transfer. So, if you wait and if you get at least 20% uh, expansion within the first hour, uh, this is a blastocyst that has been shown in various studies that would go on to implant, uh, at least it would have a higher implantation rate as compared to some uh, something that uh, doesn't exhibit a uh, re-expansion post-warming. So uh, this again is a model given by Hubert Joris that uh, if you wait for an hour and you're able to achieve at least 20% expansion, these are blastocysts that you can pick up and go ahead with for the transfer. So yeah, we do wait. Yes, Gaurav. We, uh, in our laboratory, we have actually now quantified and we uh, we found the uh, results that when blastocysts show no expansion, after two or three hours of warming at the time of transfer, we traditionally wait for about two to three hours, right. minimum two hours and maximum three hours. Uh, if they show no expansion, then the implantation rate uh, reduces by half. So, uh, so that's uh, something that we've noted. But at the same time, uh, uh, so this can be taken in a positive fashion also that despite no expansion post warming, those embryos still exhibit a substantial implantation rate, but it is definitely not as high as those embryos that uh, have completely initiated re or have completed re-expansion. So there is a major difference that we find. Okay. So wonderful. This is extremely helpful. And I think it is important to notice this re-expansion time because it is going to give us a very good insight into the implantation potential of that blastocyst. So going to the next uh, question, Vijay. Yeah, Dr. Nitin, this is uh, for you. How many embryos you prefer to load on one carrier? And what is the actual impact of this um, for the further development of rigs? And do you prefer to segregate grade 1 and grade 2 embryos or prefer to mix them to optimize probability of the pregnancy per transfer? As we know that the pregnancy depends upon both quality of the embryos as well as the uh, endometrium. And the main reason behind uh, the loading a particular number, whether it is just for the sake of reducing volume or it is the convenience and handling. Hello, Dr. Nitin. Dr. Nitin? Yeah, yeah. Vijay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, now. Yeah. Yes, uh, yeah. In this era of vitrification and with uh, all this modern uh, scientific development, now the survival rate is in the tune of almost 90% plus. And along with that, we are doing blastocyst stage freezing. That is second thing. And in case uh, we are getting almost 90 to 100% survival blastocysts, and if you transfer these blastocysts, the chances of having multiple pregnancy will be high because of the high implantation uh, potential of the blastocyst. In this ground, now we have decided that we want to freeze these blastocysts. We should freeze not more than one or maximum two blastocysts per carrier. That is the scientific explanation why we are going with maximum two blastocysts per carrier. Okay. 
Now, as regard to your part two question, that is a grade one or grade two grading uh, uh, embryos, will you like to mix it or will you like to segregate? Personally speaking, I will always like to segregate because I know for sure that suppose if I load only best quality embryo in the carrier, I am sure that I will get at least one out of two, but most of the time I get both blastocysts. So I will not like to mix uh, grade one and grade two embryo on the same carrier. I will prefer to keep best embryo in one carrier and I will not uh, rather like to freeze other in case if they are in large in number. But suppose let's say we are having only two or three, then in that case, I will prefer to have one best and one medium quality uh, embryo on first carrier and the, another best on the second carrier. Okay, that's, that's fair enough. That explains why we need to. And also, just add it. You are talking about the using one or two only if it is blastocysts. What about yeah. freezing day two or day three uh, embryos? And have you tried freezing two prone nuclei uh, embryos as well? Uh, unfortunately, no, I have not. Okay. Okay, fine. And uh, what about uh, you, uh, Pranay? Have you any experience? Experience of uh, day two? Yeah, day two or even uh, pro nuclear stage transfers? Uh, pro nuclear, no, sadly, just uh, once uh, where we did not have a good uh, experience. What happened was uh, on the day of assessment, we encountered contamination. This was four or five years ago. And we thought well, we'd be better off uh, vitifying on uh, day one itself and uh, probably we'll get rid of the uh, contaminant when we warm. But uh, sadly, it wasn't so. So that has been my only experience of PN vitification. Day two, yes, we do because we have uh, multiple clinicians coming in and some are, um, uh, that's what they want. Uh, not all of the clinicians uh, want a day five transfers because they feel that they have more attempts when they have day, day two, day three transfers. So I have... Uh, 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 sorry, I forgot your question particularly regarding day two. What exactly is it about day two that you want to know? Yeah, no, day two is how many embryos that uh, you will uh, please and will you mix the grade one grade? Yeah, I always ask the clinician uh, their request. What would they want me to uh, load on an embryo uh, on an embryo carrier device? Expect hundred percent cryo survival so that when I warm, I should be either culturing them or I should be transferring them on the same day without having to re revitrify because I don't want to uh, load, overload the cryo device, achieve 100% cryo survival and then end up revitrifying or not transferring and culturing. So that's why we don't uh, keep more than two uh, cleavage cell embryos or one blastocyst on a device, at least for the clinicians that I like. <laughs> so the ones uh, who dictate the terms, they would insist on whatever. So we have to follow that. Is there, I would like to ask you a quick question. That have, do you have any experience about vitrifying two prone nuclei and getting a good number of blastocysts out of it? Vitrifying large, large num, uh, number of eggs? Yeah, at fertilization stage. 2 pn stage. At 2 pn, we we use that. To, we used to do that some years ago, but at the end, uh, it was not worth it. Because uh, it's, it's true that it's a more stable stage than all sites, but uh, you never know if this from this 2 p.m. will come out with embryo. So we move to the idea of vitrifying or vitrifying the eggs that we had good results, or to wait until we have good embryos and just vitrify the good ones, the good quality ones. Not the intermediate stage that you know that this egg, uh, fertilized egg, probably will block and no uh, interculture, so we we just uh, uh, quit. Okay, fine. Uh, Gaurav, any special tips and tricks for loading? And uh, yeah. you just, just a yeah. couple of things. Uh, um, uh, one, since you've mentioned that uh, tricks while uh, vitrifying large number of embryos, so just make sure that you're vitrifying the most competent embryos. So if you have many embryos, then uh, I think the best thing is to put a blastocyst and that will make you freeze only the competent embryos. And uh, like we've heard so many times that the time is very important. And in case uh, we are vitrifying more than one embryo or oocyte on a particular device, then we prefer to, to make multiple small drops 
with each drop having a single embryo or a oocyte rather than putting them together in in one drop and then trying to aspirate the excess media so now uh, we have now completely adopted this through uh, we have about four people in our laboratory who perform vitrification so uh, uniformly we made a rule that we'll only freeze them in multiple drops and we've stopped the practice of aspirating the excess media so that according to because that uh, amount of manipulation can be very damaging to the embryo or the oocyte uh, and very crucial so we, once we place it on the uh, device we try not to touch that embryo or oocyte uh, again so th that's my tip absolutely to and now i has discussed uh, time and again in various on various platforms and even in during this panel discussion that if you have already standardized your laboratory to get sufficient um percentage of the blastocysts then please don't get afraid and it is better to let embryos go to blastocyst stage and vitrify at the blastocyst stage rather than vitrifying too many embryos together and giving and prolonging the time to become pregnant because that is one of the important aspect our aim is not only to make the patient pregnant but make the patient pregnant as early as uh, possible uh, coming to you pranay uh, what are the timing of the vitrification and wait timing after warming we have just uh, discussed it but uh, can you please briefly um, explain it and important consideration about the close and open systems and how many stones so we already discussed it so these are the two points okay, yeah. because we are running out of time so my timeline remains the same i do pick ups at 35 hours post hct and my xc denudation and xc are at 39 hours to 40 hours and i would like to keep, keep the same timeline for the uh, vitrified warm do site so what we do is we do pick ups at uh, 35 hours and within a couple of hours uh, maximum 3 hours we go on to do uh, the denudation and vitrification uh, and once we warm the oocytes on the day of uh, uh, the xc uh, we allow them to uh, be in the culture uh, for at least a couple of hours for the spindle to uh, restabilize or repolymerize so that's our uh, timeline so we end up doing the xcs at 39 to 40 years post xcg whether it's fresh or frozen embryo uh, frozen oocytes fine i think we will just a little bit faster go to the next question uh, guru regarding the uh, i'd like to ask uh, is sir that in your laboratory what would you prefer to use for your donor eggs program whether you would like to go for the fresh eggs or the frozen eggs or it do really doesn't make any difference as soon as you have in the lab uh, this uh, a good vitrification system and a high percentage of survival rate near 100% it can be a problem to use fresh or frozen in our case it's a little bit special because you have to take into consideration two things first thing is that we work for international patients that means that uh, most of the patients that uh, 99% of the patients that we have they just uh, send us the sperm the freeze the sperm or they freeze the sperm in the lab and they just come for the transfer and we have a huge egg donation problem uh, and we don't have waiting list so as soon as we have these two considerations we and and we have the sperm frozen in our lab and a lot of donors we uh, prefer always uh, to do in a fresh cycle because we avoid the economical cost of which if we uh, find all the eggs one for one and then throwing the procedure so we it's economical it's a it's a economical balance because we we, we work that way but in a lab i could say that in your lab uh you have a very good uh, vitrification program mm, it has to be the same fresh or frozen but in our lab particularly we use fresh for this uh, reducing the, the economical cost of vitrifying without no need okay fine thanks as we are running a little bit short of time goral i think the next questions we have already discussed in details vitrifications of the biopsy embryos and the practical tips of uh, You know, when we have a large number of biopsy embryos, so I hand over it to you uh, to go to the next questions. Sure. Really precious, very very precious, and we have to ensure completely that they survive. Otherwise, there is not going to be any point of doing the PGT and uh, vitrifying them and the whole exercise. So, just very quickly in one or two sentences, Gaurav, any tips on vitrifying biopsy embryos? no see like uh, like i said we any 
we, we anyways, we, we want to artificially collapse the cavity uh, before yeah. occupying an embryo. So uh, doing a biopsy does that for us. Yeah. So obviously, we don't want the embryo to again re-expand. Uh, if we leave it post-biopsy, then in a matter of a couple of hours, it is it will re-expand. So then we will again have to re-initiate re uh, shrinkage before we vitrify them. So for our uh, in our laboratory, once we do the embryo biopsy, we pass the embryos, we, we remove the uh, biopsy clump of trophectoderm and we pass the embryo to the other embryologist who is instantly performing vitrification. Oh, no. Thank you, Gaurav. We are running short of time, but you have you are so much experience in this that I had to ask you this question. Yeah. So now the next very practical question. Many of us face this that, you know, sometimes we, especially when we receive embryos from another company, different commercial media. This is a very common question that gets asked to me all the time. So Pranay, some, can you throw some light on this? Yeah, we face the same situation. And though two beginners uh, on paper, I would not go on to say that, yeah, you can do that. And, and yet that you should be sticking to the manufacturer's recommendations. Because if something goes wrong, you cannot uh, blame anybody and you cannot effectively, uh, effectively troubleshoot the situation. But if you are stuck between a rock and a hard place, I mean, uh, I think, yeah, we have had uh, some experience with warming uh, embryos that have been uh, frozen and uh, vitrified in a different solution. And we have had good class survival at pregnancies. And there have been ample studies that have uh, looked at various combinations and they have found out that it works. It works for various combinations and you are able to have adequate cryo survival. So if you are in a hard, uh, uh, if you are stuck up in a uh, situation like that, you can go ahead. All right. So that's a very good take home message for all our participants that you can safely interchange media if there is any need. question storage of embryos now all of us have now so many storage tanks we are freezing so many embryos oocytes blastocyst so uh, is there is there any effect of long term storage on the clinical outcome because we end up storing these embryos for really many many years yes sir okay i yes, sir are you there I think we have lost her, but she has sent me this slide which says that so far there is really no effect. There is this, uh, there are many papers which have shown that long-term storage has no effect on the embryos. However, while doing research for this question, I had come across this very recent paper, Ju July 2020, last month, which did show some effect on long-term storage. However, there were many limitations to this study. So I think we still go with that the embryos. Pranay, very quickly, how long do you cryopreserve embryos? Yeah, so when we started, uh, we looked at uh, ICMA for guidance and uh, sure enough, uh, in their contents, the sample contents, it does mention that you can store the cryopreserve of the embryos and oocytes for five years. And uh, But it does not explicitly say that uh, at the end of five years, what you have to do. So what we do, especially for our uh, select patient subgroups like patients desiring uh, crab reservation for oncofertility who are going to have their embryos in crab storage for longer duration. We submit a uh, sample, uh, submit a consent form uh, that we had gotten signed initially and uh, a request for renewal of the same uh, from the patient and we send it across to the ICMR by mail or uh, uh, what we do is we send it in duplicate. We mail them as well and we send a register post. And uh, in case our patient does not desire uh, uh, continual uh, storage, uh, what we do is we do inform them annually uh, and in case we don't hear from them, we send them a registered letter uh, which is signed uh, uh, for and uh, on two different occasions and if we still don't be hear from them, we are, uh, it says in their initial consent that we are uh, good to go, uh, good, uh, we can go ahead and, destroy, uh, and discard them. Discard them. Yeah. Right. Great. Thank you, Pranay. Uh, so any practical aspects, uh, Gaurav, some challenges that we face because of so many such huge inventory? You have to unmute yourself, Gaurav. Sorry, yeah. sorry. Now is the time to start thinking about high capacity storage tank systems Absolutely. with centralized uh, liquid nitrogen supply. This is something new and uh, uh, with automatic filling, 
this is becoming very important and we also now need to start thinking about outsourcing cryo storage or relocation of cryo storage and this in the coming years will be uh, uh, will become necessary since uh, people will run out of space and tanks and uh, uh, how will they monitor so many embryos and it's it's a huge liability on the head of so i think now the next way to go will be outsourcing cryo storage sending off embryos to storage facilities where there is where there are proper alarm systems monitoring systems automatic filling and then uh, you know requesting for embryos uh, as per uh, need so this is this is the future of storage of embryos right thank you gaurav for these practical inputs and finally last but certainly not the least we come to the, the most important factor in optimizing vitrification outcomes and that is training what vitrification dr lard then hello uh, gorol i can't hear you properly anybody can take this gorol you tell us something about the importance of training in vitrification it it's very very important it's imp it's important to make sure that multiple people uh should be trained in vitrification because it's a very uh, it requires a lot of concentration so you need fresh people you need a team of people vitrifying and now since the load of vitrification is increasing so much in all laboratories uh, it becomes uh, extremely hard for one person to be vitrifying embryo after embryo after embryo after embryo so uh, the importance of having a team uh to vitrify is uh, is very important as you've said that it is highly operator dependent so that itself emphasizes that you must have multiple operators then you know who are all adequately trained uh in vitrification there is a certain learning curve associated but it's very easy to overcome that with uh, with you know adequate practice and so that's my take for vitrification Fine. I think Guru, is that we are running out of time, Sana? Yeah, this is. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. 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 Sorry, I was again lost. I have not heard what Guru has answered, but yes, training is extremely important, and I. We move. I. I think we lost you. Yeah, the connection is down. And training becomes. Yeah. I think. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm not. Uh... Can you stop, please? Is there a problem? Yeah. Um, I guess she has some issues with the network. Yeah, for sure. All right. Yeah, there are a lot of problems with the internet. Please, it is time for you to conclude and final remarks. Yeah, yeah. So uh, thank you, uh, my panelists and my speakers for wonderful uh, panel and wonderful talk uh, on vitrification technique. So this is our next webinar. Please uh, do join us on this webinar. Can you see that web? Thing. It is coming so or not? It was visible, but now it has. Uh, so you have to reshare. Stop share screen and again reshare. Sir. Okay. You reach the end of it. Please go to the previous slide. Okay. You need to go to the previous slide. Okay. Bye. Yeah. so thank you thank you very much uh, dr uh, gebrosta and dr esta dr vijay dr gorav dr lard dr pane everyone and of course our participant and thanks uh, to dadas kadila for sponsoring this program thank you so much and please 
uh, again join us on 22nd very wonderful topic revising fertilization strategy in art and 29th embryo quality and implantation potential thank, thank you you thank you sana, thank you, thank you. Uh, sana yes sir yes sir i'm here or mr sudeep is there um unfortunately he had to log out he was here but he had to log out yeah. so he won't be available today okay okay log out david so so it's okay thank you so much sir uh, thank you to all the faculties as well uh, for such an uh, enriching talk uh, i do not know much about embryology but obviously there were some new insights so it was a learning thing for me as well and a very well conducted uh, even the discussion the panel discussion so thanking all delegates uh, and all attendees for attending so thank you so much thank you very much hello thank you thank you very much bye bye